We're back, we're back, and if you're here, we never left. Let's open our Bibles, Genesis chapter 42. If you're just tuning in, God bless you, we love you. If you're here in the sanctuary or foyer, good to see your face. We think of every time we come together, don't we, fellas, and we talk about it during the week, those we still haven't seen yet, we haven't forgotten about you. If you still just don't feel that you can come in person, Know that we love you. Jesus loves you. He's not ashamed of you. Doesn't, you know, think less of you. He calls us to come. He calls us to come without question. But again, there's grace there and there's understanding on our part. So everything we do, we want to make sure that we're reaching out in, in this format. And, and uh, the Lord's been using it as we've been saying and, and noticing, reaching out to a lot of people through this focus on a broadcasted service. But for me, I tell you what, it'll always be about who's sitting in front of me. I think that's primarily how the Spirit moves and how the Spirit speaks. Though He is not restrained in any way and does things that are far beyond our understanding, right? And how God speaks about His Word and when His Word goes out, it'll never return void. Isn't that amazing? Right? But Jesus told His disciples when two or more are gathered, there's something special. So... For me, it's always about the faces, I think, that are in front of me, but uh, even if you're not here, we still remember your face and we pray for you and, and we're teaching you today, as is our privilege. Amen? If you're here in the sanctuary, amen, and it's so good to hear, amen. It's fantastic. I love hearing you guys worship in person. Let's open our Bibles if they're not yet open. If you're at home, grab your Bible, open it up, call the kids to come, boy, Let's all enjoy the word together this morning. Let's take notes. Uh, the Bible reminds us to have an ear to listen to what the Holy Spirit's going to say to us today, to make sure that we're doers of the word and not just hearers only. Amen. So let's take notes. Let's listen in and see what the Lord has for us. How blessed are we to come and just freely open God's word this morning and just read wherever we are and hear what he has to say. That is freedom. That is a blessing. I pray that that's something you're considering, especially as you prepare to vote in this season. I want to be as free to follow Jesus, how about you boys, as possible. And so that's going to govern over, as many other things will, guide my votes. I pray that you're taking the time to do that, appreciating the Word of God uh, that we have today. So Genesis 42, verse 1, i got to say the title. Um, James came up with this, I think, and I love it. If you read ahead, you'll get the joke, reunited and it feels not so good, right? If you read ahead, you, you know where we are and we're going to talk about Joseph and his brothers and Jacob and so on and so forth. Uh, but even though we're reading a chapter of history, right? The book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, this is a chapter about a family that's going to be formed into a nation. Uh, we remember that this book and every other book in the Bible is about Jesus. There's Jesus in every single page of this Bible, right? And so this family is being transformed into a nation through whom will come our Savior, Jesus. And I was thinking about this this week, fellas, how Jesus did not pick a continent or a country that existed at that time, lest anyone say, Jesus is this color, or Jesus comes from this country, or Jesus speaks this language, he made a new one, one that didn't exist, right? And so there's something there for us. Jesus is the, to be the centerpiece of our lives, and Jesus is the key, um, certainly, to a lot of the issues that we are struggling with these days, and the tensions, racial tensions, and misunderstandings, and so on and so forth. And we'll have some material for you uh, to consider in the coming weeks to that end. But we study the Bible. If this is weird to you, you're watching and streaming online, why are they opening this book and reading weird things? To the one who doesn't know, it's, it's strange, it's weird. But we do this because we love Jesus, because he meets with us and speaks to us as we read his word. And we get to be a part of this beautiful story of salvation, how the Lord has saved the world and still seeks to save the world. Amen, fellas. And so we're continuing on. Pastor Andy, all yours. Absolutely. Let's read chapter 42. Uh, but before we begin, let's uh, go ahead and pray. Lord Jesus, thank we you. love you. We thank you, Lord God, for your word, for the reality uh, of your love for us, Lord God, and how you've given us 
your word to shape our lives, Lord Jesus. So help us to yield to your spirit this morning, Lord God. Minister to us directly through the power of your word, the power of your spirit, Lord God. Pour into us, Lord God, and build us up into the people that you want us to be, Lord God. May we make a difference in this world for your kingdom, Lord God, as your ambassadors, Lord Jesus, this great mm-hmm. responsibility you've placed upon Christians, but you don't leave us at it alone, Lord God, but you fill us with your spirit to overflowing, Lord God. So I pray that you would do so. I pray that, again, you would minister to us through your word, and we just thank you, Lord God, for it and for uh, yourself, Lord God, and for the love that you've given us, Lord Jesus. Thanks. In your name we pray all these things. Amen. 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 All right, so we're in chapter 42. Uh, And we're going to see the reunion of the family, uh, of the children of Jacob, right? In the previous chapters, we've been looking at the story of Joseph, this crazy story, right? He was betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery. Uh, He was in in an Egyptian prison, right? And he was called out of the prison to interpret the dream of Pharaoh. He didn't understand it. So what was it again, right? That the seven years of famine, or rather the seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. And Pharaoh uh, elevated Joseph into a position of power. He's a a governor that's second second only to Pharaoh himself, right? And he's going to handle all the collections and distribution of food, right? Anyone who's going to want to eat during the seven-year period of famine needs to go directly to Joseph, right? And so from the pit to the palace, as they say, right? From the bottom into the very... Uh, the very top obviously the grace of the Lord Jesus is on his life but meanwhile it's not just Egypt that's experiencing the famine right Uh, nations surrounding Egypt they're experiencing it as well including the land of Canaan which is where Jacob and his uh, 11 other sons are currently living so let's look at verse 1 it says when Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt he said to his sons why do you look at one another, right? And some translations say, why are you guys keep staring at each other? Why do you guys just like, what, what, what are you guys just twiddling your thumbs for, right? And, and the sort of uh, what we're getting from this is a, is a degree of, of confusion and concern, right? They heard the name, the name Egypt and immediately a flood of memories, right, of what they did. For, it's been 20 years, you guys, 20 years since uh, the, the, since Joseph was sold into slavery up until the first year of the famine, right? And this whole time they've been hiding this thing from their father. Oh, look at this bloody coat that belonged to your son. You know, what could have happened to him, right? And hiding this, 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 uh, this sin from their father uh, this entire time. And so as we study this particular section of this chapter, we're going to be looking at that sort of lifestyle of sin, that sinful lifestyle. Uh, a life of sin is difficult, right? We know that probably from experience. We know that uh, from what the Bible tells us, right? Uh, but also hiding that sin, which our, our flesh will, will incline to do, right? But hiding that sin does not help one bit. In fact, it only makes things worse. I, I, I remember... When I was younger, I was playing hide and, hide and seek with, with my cousin. I was probably like seven. He was like four or five. And I go and look for him. I'm it. And so I go and look for him. And I go into the hallway. And immediately, I see this lump. He, what he did was he just sat in the hallway with a blanket over his head and thought that I couldn't see him, right? And so likewise with sin, right? We, we, we might be able to fool somebody, may even be able to fool ourselves, right? But we can't fool God. And that sin that we're hiding, that big lump under that blanket that's fooling nobody, right, is going to destroy us from the inside out. Uh, and so uh, we see throughout this chapter the, 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 the guilt factor uh, take its toll on these ten brothers that betrayed Joseph. Uh, verse 2, and he said, Behold, I have heard that there is grain for sale in Egypt. Go down and buy grain for us there that we may live and not die so ten of joseph's brothers went down to buy grain in egypt but jacob did not send benjamin joseph's brother with his brothers so he feared for he feared that harm might happen to him 
Thus the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Right? And so we see uh, Jacob has become a sort of overprotective father. He's lost his favorite wife, who was Rachel. He's lost his favorite son, who was Joseph. And to him, all that he has left is Benjamin, to remember uh, Rachel by. And so he doesn't want to lose him as well. Verse 6, now Joseph was governor over the land. He was the one who sold to all the people of the land. And, jo and Joseph's brothers came and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. So, you know, two decades later, possibly more, right, we see a partial fulfillment of Joseph's dream, that his brothers are going to bow down to him, right? And, and, and this is uh, in, fulfilled in greater through the person of Jesus Christ, as we've been noting these parallels between uh, Joseph and Jesus, rejected by his brothers, right? Rejected by his own, that is, uh, the Jews. And in Zechariah 13, verse 6, this makes it clear prophetically where it says, and if one asks him, what are these wounds on your back? He will say, the wounds I have received in the house of my friends, right? The people he was sent to save turned on him, right? But that's going to change eventually, right? If you see the book of Revelation, and you know, obviously you see all these crazy things happening, you know, you know, a lot of bloodshed and war and famine, right? But it's a book of hope. It's a book of redemption. It's a book of, you know, you got the 144,000 young Jewish men that are going to go around and evangelize. Millions of people come to Christ. People that were, have rejected him and, and missed out on the rapture will eventually come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, including the nation of Israel. And likewise, they will eventually bow down in the same way that Joseph's brothers did. And in both these scenarios, the, they wanted to stop the plan of God, right? And they wanted to, to stop the dream from meeting its fulfillment and were unwittingly part of its fulfillment, right? So we see the God, uh, the God, uh, God's sovereignty work in a very special way in Joseph's life, in Jesus' life, and of course, even in ours. And in verse 7, it says, Joseph saw his brothers and recognized him, but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? He said, they said, from the land of Canaan to buy food, right? And so Joseph is going to be a little bit tricky in, in the next few chapters. And some say that, oh, he's being petty or he's being vengeful. I really don't think so. Uh, I think that he could have had vengeance pretty easily considering his position. He could have said, I know these guys. Guards, take them away and do whatever you want to them, right? Put them in, for, for, put them in, in jail for two, seven, ten years and see how they mm -hmm. like it, right? Uh, but he doesn't. And honestly, I think his primary concern is for his brother, uh, Benjamin, to see how he's being treated, to see if they've changed, to see if perhaps the, the abuse that they showed Joseph, perhaps they're giving towards uh, uh, Benjamin. Uh, but also the Lord is sovereignly using Joseph as an instrument of correction, right? And he does that, especially when we're living a life of sin. Don't shy away from the correction of the Lord. It's good for you. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says, my child, don't reject the Lord's discipline. And don't be upset when he corrects you, for the Lord corrects those he loves, just as a father corrects a child in whom he delights. Continuing on in verse eight, it says, and Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him, right? And so if we're going to look at this sort of spiritual parallel, right, anyone who, who is uh, backslidden or has become prodigal or whatever else, right, can probably relate to that, right? The Lord being so close and, and doing a work and the spiritual blinders are on, right? When you live a life of sin, the spiritual blinders are, are on and you don't mm. see what's right in front of you, right? Oh, God has left me. He doesn't want anything to do with me. Or, or he's just sitting in heaven kind of pointing his finger at me, right? Not realizing he's so close. He's reaching out to save you from yourself, right? And it's only by the, the, the power of the spirit and the repentance of the heart that we eventually uh, experience that sort of restoration 
Uh, we may think of him as, as, as distant, but in reality, he's right there reaching out to you. In verse 9, it says, And Joseph remembered the dreams that he had uh, dreamed of them, and he said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. And they said to him, No, my lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. Yeah, right. Your servants have never been spies, right? And, and, and all, you know, this honest man, they're, they're continuing to perpetuate this lie about the fate of their brother to their father, eventually to Joseph himself. We're going to see in a couple of verses, right? Oh, one of them is no more. Oh, you know, he died and, and we don't really know, you know, what became of him or whatever else, right? Whatever lie they're perpetuating. Um, you know, and it just reminds me of how foolish we can be, right? Oh, I'm a good person. God's going to let me into heaven because, you know, I haven't, I haven't killed anyone, right? I, I'm not that bad. There's, there's way worse people uh, than I am, right? But, but what, the, what does the Bible say? That none are good, right? And it's for these, 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 these uh, people who aren't good. Heaven is not a place for good people. Heaven is a place for forgiven people, right? And so none of this honest man uh, nonsense, it's not true. And in verse 12, uh, here's where, where they perpetuate that lie. He said to them, no, it is the nakedness of the land that you have come to see. And they said, we are your servants. Uh, we, your servants, are 12 brothers, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. Behold, the youngest is uh, this day with our father, and one of them is no more. Right? And, and so perhaps there's this sort of out of sight, out of mind mentality. Uh, Hebrew scholars tend to agree that what they mean by this one is no more is that they're effectively saying that he's dead, right? He's, he's either dead to them or, or dead literally, right? Uh, but either way, this out of sight, out of mind uh, nonsense does not apply to the things of God, right? Uh, you know, people say, oh, I don't... I don't necessarily believe in God. That doesn't change the reality of his existence. That doesn't change the reality that he loves you. It doesn't change the reality that he's calling you away from sin, away from the flesh, away from the things of this world, right? And into his kingdom and into his purposes that he has specifically for you, right? And so uh, they have yet to realize that Joseph is indeed alive and well and not still in slavery. And in verse 14 it says, uh, But Joseph said to them, it is, it, it is as I said to you, uh, you are spies. By this you shall be tested. By the life of Pharaoh you shall not go from this place unless your youngest uh, brother comes here. Right? He wants to check up on Benjamin. They're saying that he's with his father. How does he even know that for sure? Right? They nearly killed Joseph. And so for all he knows, Benjamin might be uh, have, have suffered the same or a similar kind of fate. Send one of you, verse 16, and let, let him bring your brother uh, while uh, you remain confined that your words may be tested whether there is truth in you or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together in custody for three days, right? So thrown in prison for three days, again, I don't think this is vengeance. I think three days is not exactly vengeance compared to the several years that Joseph spent in prison. But I think if we're going to continue with this spiritual parallel, right, that's exactly what sin does. It imprisons you. Uh, Jesus says in John 8, 34, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. Galatians 5, 1 says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Hmm. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to, the, to a yoke of slavery, right? Don't go back there. Don't submit again. We've been there, right? We've submitted to uh, the sinful tendencies. We've allowed things uh, to, like, like thorns, entangle our lives, right? And the Lord set us free. And, and we see that in John 8, 36, where Jesus continues, So if the Son sets you free, mm. you will be free indeed. A life of sin creates a life of guilt. We, and you know, sin is not 
sin because it's it's because uh, God's a party pooper, right? Sin is sin because it's destructive. It mm -hmm. destroys people. It destroys family, right? Uh, and yet, hiding it sometimes we think, oh, you know, I can have my cake and eat it too, right? That does not help uh, whatsoever. Hiding it only creates more problems and will eventually make us numb to the things of God. And the life of sin will imprison us. Mm. And the only solution is an encounter with Jesus Christ. He sets the captive free. Uh, when we believe for believers, if anyone has gone back to that yoke of slavery, we know that he's just... He's, he's um, able and willing and, and, and ready to forgive us, to set us free once again. But he also corrects and he also restores. If that's you this morning, if there's something under the carpet that you've, you've swept under, right? there's something under the blanket. I remember my cousin, he found a kitty. He found a little, a little kitten. And he didn't want to tell his family, so he, he hid it in the closet, right? Uh, and, and eventually the closet started to meow, right? You can't hide the cat forever, right? It gets bigger, it gets louder, and, hmm. and you know, I'm not a big cat fan, but sin is a whole lot worse than cats. Sin is a whole lot worse than lions or sharks or bears, oh my, whatever else, right? It's a monster, and it'll make a monster out of you unless you repent, you turn to the Lord and receive that abundant grace that God is offering you. Mm. And so if that's you this morning, my prayer is that you receive that unconditional love that the Lord is offering you. All you need to do is turn to Him, forsake what is destructive, and turn to what will build you up. Amen to that. Amen. Let's move on to verse 18. Genesis chapter 42. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you are in custody, and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your households, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be, will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. So we see here in these first three verses, uh, verses 18 to 20, uh, Joseph's request. Uh, the brothers spend three days in custody, three days in jail, like Pastor Andy mentioned. And, uh, but Joseph slightly changes the request this time. Uh, one, one brother will stay and be imprisoned while the rest go home and, and take care of business. And deliver the provisions and bring back their youngest brother, right, or, or else. They were to prove their honesty by following orders, and really, it only took them three days in jail, and they were ready to do anything to get out, right? Even if that means leaving one of their brothers behind and bring back Benjamin with them. Uh, you know, like Pastor Andy said, this was nothing compared to what, what Joseph experienced, but uh, prison seemed like it was a really bad experience for these brothers to be that abrupt in their answer, right? To say yes to Joseph right away, right? They didn't know probably if they were going to get out. They didn't know what was going to happen to their dad if they didn't get out. And hey, there's a famine happening, right? Despite that, Joseph shows grace by letting them all go, except for one. Let's move on to verse 21. Then they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, Did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? But you did not listen. So now there comes a reckoning for his blood. And so we talked about Joseph's grace in letting the brothers go and having one stay behind. But even more grace is shown in Joseph's trust. Uh, what if the brothers don't come back? Right? What if they treat Simeon the way they treated Joseph? Just you know, leave him alone and leave him out to rot. What if they abandon him? But this feeling of guilt 
And Pastor Andy touched on sin and its effects, and one of its effects is, is guilt and shame. Uh, this feeling of guilt came rushing back to them in remembering their sin against <coughs> Joseph. Right? The, the, the translation that we see here uh, uses the word guilty, and the word guilty here implies being liable or being at fault, resulting in direct consequences as punishment to the guilty. Uh, the exact reason the brothers give as to why all this was happening, right? All this is happening to us, all these bad things happening to us is a direct consequence of what we did to Joseph. That was their conclusion. It's interesting that uh, their reaction, right? This reaction from, for, from Joseph's request uh, weighed heavily on them, right? We know it weighed heavily on them because... Uh, the first thing that came to mind when all this was happening to them was that they did Joseph wrong. Might have, you know, and I'm just, might be just conjecture, but it you know, might have haunted their dreams. Right? They might have woken up from the middle of the night in a cold sweat, right, thinking about what they did to their brother mm -hmm. and where he is now. That's what guilt does. That's what shame does. Sometimes we can be quick to associate our greatest troubles as consequences for our biggest sins, feeling like we're being punished for being bad. Right? The brothers certainly felt this way during this time, but regardless of how they felt, one thing is sure, sin always has consequences, and they're never good. They're never good. And these consequences uh, that the brothers are suddenly now realizing how painful they were, Let's read verse 23, moving on. They did not know that Joseph understood them, for there was an interpreter between them. Then he turned away from them and wept. And he turned to them and spoke to them, and he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. So Joseph's reaction to all of this, his brothers talking amongst themselves, uh, talking about what they did to him uh, was so emotional that he had to turn away or else he would have given his identity away. Right? He, he had to go another place to cry. But Joseph knew that this, you know, what was happening to his brothers was far better than any earthly provision he could give. Yeah. Right? Far better than any grain, far better than any food or drink or, or perk that Joseph could give them that any type of physical blessing is always going to be trumped by any and every spiritual blessing. His heart here, right? Joseph's heart is shown uh, in that more than the grain and food his brothers were bringing back home, he saw God at work in their hearts. Like the Lord is doing something in his brothers, right? These are the brothers who, you know, like we've, 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 we've seen and, and we've read what they have done, right? Killed people. Right? in cold blood, ransacked villages and whatnot, deceived and deceived and deceived some more. But he saw God at work in their hearts. And so he cried. It was emotional. He saw that there was a certain change happening in them. And then we also see that Simeon was the one chosen to be left behind and was tied up in front of them. Uh, there are a couple of conclusions as to why it was Simeon who was chosen, but... Uh, a lot of Bible scholars believe that they chose Simeon because he was uh, the youngest, I mean the oldest brother uh, when, when, uh, when Joseph was taken, Reuben being absent when it happened. And so Simeon was responsible. Verse 25 through 28. And Joseph gave orders to fill their bags with grain and to replace every man's money in his sack and to give them provisions for the journey. And this was done for them. Then they loaded their donkeys with their grain and departed. And as one of them opened his sack to give his donkey fodder at the lodging place, he saw his money in the mouth of his sack. He said to his brothers, my money has been put back. Here it is in the mouth of my sack. At this their hearts failed them, and they turned trembling to one another, saying, what is this that God has done to us? And so Joseph, again, shows grace by secretly not only sending the brothers home with 
with grain, but replacing the money that they used to pay him and throwing in extra provisions for them. One of the brothers saw the money he has uh, as he opened his sack to feed his donkey and immediately their hearts sank at that sight, right? Uh, and, and, and I love that the Hebrew uses that phrase because that's exactly what happened. They got, this, you know, when you got caught doing something bad, right? Or you got caught with, with something that you're not supposed to have. Like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have done that, right? That was their feeling. That was what was in their hearts because they knew that if, if Joseph found out that their money was gone, they would be accused of theft. When in reality, it was Joseph who freely gave it to them. But we can also see that God was already working in their hearts. Uh, you know, they could have easily hidden the money, right? Oh, sure, we'll take it. Or not tell anybody about it. Or maybe even think that they deserve the money. Hey, we did our time. Like, three days is a long time in prison. Like, give us back our money. We deserve this. But the brothers, who were so accustomed to deceit and all things evil, right, we know this, suddenly turned to God for answers, not knowing how to handle the grace they've been given. You don't know what's happening, God. Why is this happening to us? Now, this is one story, but really has two sides to it, two perspectives to learn from. We have the brothers, right, the regret, and, and in the form of their guilt and shame. And then we have Joseph, right, his grace and, and the forgiveness that he showed. Um, and so just as it, it's important to, to shed light on the effects of sin, which is guilt and shame, it's also important that we consider how Joseph handled the situation, the grace and the forgiveness that, that he imparted upon his his, his brothers. And so just a couple of thoughts really quickly regarding these verses. The first one is that God uses certain situations to bring us back to the places of our disobedience and rebellion. Mm. Right? God does that. And we know this for sure. Even, even I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm talking to the choir here. Like we know this through experience. And we look back to Genesis 37, right? How the brothers violently disposed of Joseph, right? Stripped him down. Right, and threw him into the pit. And what did they do next? If you remember, what they did next was they had a picnic. Right? They had lunch. They had food. They didn't care about Joseph. I'm hungry. Let me just you know, pass the ketchup. Pass the salt. And then they sell him to be a slave, and then they lie to their father about him being attacked by an animal. Right? These brothers are ruthless. And as Pastor Andy touched on it earlier, for 20 years, this was their secret. And surely it haunted the brothers. And again, we know this because they were so distressed by it. Numbers 32, 23 reminds us of that sobering truth, right? Be sure your sin will find you out. Sin that is hidden, sin that is not repented of, will slowly consume each and every one of us. It's like a disease, right? Mm. And that's why James so beautifully puts it in 516, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. There's healing involved in confession. Now, if you find yourself in the same situation as the brothers, right? If something in your life has been causing the Holy Spirit to convict you, right? Of certain sins. If Pastor Andy's words or my words are making you squirm a little bit in your seats, good. You're not alone, right? Been there, done that. Know that Jesus can provide healing mm -hmm. and restoration. Healing comes conf from confession and restoration comes from repentance. Secondly, Joseph's grace and forgiveness is a picture of the grace and forgiveness we find in Jesus. Now, we've seen time and time again how Joseph is a type of Jesus, right? The brothers, you know, clearly didn't get what they deserve, right? They, you know, they, they, they got grace. They got freedom from jail. They, they got grain and, and food and then some. And even though they haven't directly repented yet, we see the inward struggle amongst the brothers when it came to their sin. And Joseph's actions indicate that he had no ill will towards them, right? He actually wanted to bless them and that he forgave them. Which is amazing if you think about what Joseph went through, right? Years passed. You know, and all these dreams are, 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 are 
being brought to Joseph's mind and, you know, he's interpreting them and prophesying them. And then there's just this one dream that hasn't come true yet. Right? That dream of, of his brothers bowing down to him. Now, imagine Joseph and how his mind was working. How am I going to react when my brothers actually come and bow down to me? Because I know the dream is coming true. You know, because God has done that before for me here in Egypt. What is my reaction going to be? His response wasn't bitterness. His response wasn't resentment. It was love. And just like the brothers, we, in our own sin and flesh, have caused God pain. Right? We've talked about that, that quote before, that when we sin, we don't just break God's rules. We break his heart. Like the brothers, there are times when we don't recognize Joseph, right? When we don't recognize Jesus. And sometimes we may think he doesn't understand us, but he does. Even in the darkest valley, he is there. Even in the midst of sin, he is available and mighty to save. Romans 5, verses 7 through 8 says this, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's grace. That's, that's love. None of us deserve it. None of us earned it. The brothers sure didn't. And grace is not a response to how good or bad we are or, or how religious or spiritual we are. It's simply an outpouring of God's love. It's a gift from him that he freely gives because he's good. Mm. And like the brothers, we may be led to believe that grace is too good to be true, right? I don't know what to do with these blessings. God, what are you doing to us? But that only applies to an unrepentant heart that does not recognize God. If we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, then we know how good repentance is. The repentance comes from a place of love, right? Mm. A place of submission, like the brothers, we must also do the practical, right? They had to get up and, and go. They had to get up from Canaan and go and, and seek bread somewhere else because there was famine in, in the land. They were forced to do so. They had to go where the bread was. They had to go where life was. And the same way can be said about the Christian life, right? In, the, in our barrenness, in our famine, right? In our, in our uh, quenched lands, right? In, 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 in our guilt, in our shame, our regrets, our discouragement, from sin and all the rest, we go to Jesus. We go to his comfort. We go to his peace. We go to his joy. We go to the source, right? We go to the bread of life in order to get provision, in order to be sustained, in order to be fed. That's what's good. That's a good place to be. And so we confess, we repent, and we are healed, and we start walking with him once again. And again, what grace that is, what love that is. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. I think the Holy Spirit's speaking today. I trust we're listening. Amen. That concept of lukewarmness in Revelation 3 is Jesus is prophetically speaking to the churches, right? The church of our age and a few others as well. That concept of lukewarmness, right? Better to be hot, even good to be cold, right? That coldness of conviction calling us to come to the Lord who feeds us and cleanses us and washes us, but to be lukewarm, to be receiving the things of the Lord, the hotness and yet the coldness of sin. Boy, a dangerous place to be. And so if the Lord's speaking to you today, uh, make sure we respond. Amen? Amen? Don't isolate yourself from the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you think he's talking to you, he is. Let's keep reading Genesis 42, verse 29. Continuing on, closing the chapter. When they came to Jacob, their father in the land of Canaan, they told him all that had happened to them, saying, kind of recounting the story here, the man, the Lord of the land, spoke roughly to us and took us to be spies of the land. But we said to him, we're honest men. We have never been spies. You know, commentary has been provided of that. We are 12 brothers, sons of our father. One is no more, and the youngest is this day with our father in the land of Canaan. Then the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, By this I shall know that you are honest, man. Leave one of your brothers with me and take grain for the famine of your households. Go your way. Bring your youngest brother to me. Then I shall know that you're not spies but honest men. And I will deliver your brother to you, and you shall trade in the land. As they emptied their sacks, behold, every man's bundle of money was in his sack. 
And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, this is what we're going to focus on. You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And now you would take Benjamin. All this has come against moi, me. Then Reuben said to his father, crazy Reuben, uh, uh, kill my two sons if I don't bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I'll bring him back to you. Not really helping. But he said, my son shall not go down with you for his brother is dead and he's the only one left. And we've talked about that. If harm should happen to him on the journey that you were to make, you would bring this, this old man down to death. You would bring down my gray hairs with sorrow to hell or to the grave, was Jacob's reply, Jacob's response. And so this is a firm no from Jacob. Whether Simeon's alive or dead, hey, let's just call him dead, who cares? And it's, it's no, it's absolutely not. And yet, they're going to head back down as we'll see next time. But focus on this with me. Uh, verse 36 in the New Living Translation, Jacob exclaimed, you are robbing me of my children. Joseph is gone. Simeon is gone. And now you want to take Benjamin to everything. Everything is against me. One Bible student said that Jacob's song was this. No one loves me. This I know. My misfortunes tell me so. Think that, think that through again. No one loves me. This I know. It's obvious. My misfortunes tell me so. Let's look, uh, take a minute. Let's look at Jacob here and learn a thing or two about ourselves. His reaction is understandable. We've all done this, right? But let's all agree together it's not acceptable, right? It's understandable, his response, this pity party, the emotional response, but it's not acceptable, especially as the leader Israel of this nation and the father of this family. Men, we have got to be better and constantly chasing after that goal to be better because there are those underneath us who are listening and looking and watching and studying our every movement, our every response. I remember growing up under Pastor Chuck Smith and just listening and receiving and watching and, and all the rest and the model of faith that he always was for us to follow, right? Just rejoicing and truly from his heart rejoicing when something terrible or seemingly terrible happened. Tragedy struck. Uh, nonetheless, we're looking to the Lord. We're trusting in the Lord. We have faith in God. This response from Jacob comes from many things, I think, but it, it certainly comes from fear. He looks at the outward circumstances here. He saw the money in their sacks. That's not good. He heard the story and how rough or seemingly no good reason this guy was rough with his sons. He heard the demand, send down your, your last remaining son and, and, you know, I won't see you again unless you bring him down. Simeon was in a dungeon. Simeon could have been dead. And so Jacob's heart was, was captivated by his circumstances. He was afraid and thus he despaired. And he gives this, this explosion, this eruption of just this speech of despair, right? Fear oftentimes lead us, uh, leads us to despair. And when you despair, you do foolish things. And that's kind of what he does here. This is just a foolish little speech. First of all, he lashes out against his sons here, right? They're coming and just reporting the facts and kind of what they need to do. But he lashes, it's all your fault and it's you and it's this. And he lashes out against his sons. And secondly, he exaggerates his situation. All things, everything's against me. I just may as well die, right? Um... And we do those things when fear comes, when we're feeling despair, we lash out against those who are coming to us and especially trying to encourage us and comfort us and build us up and, and maybe even weep with us. And yet that's not even good enough. We lash out. Have you ever tried to reach out to a person who's feeling bitter or feeling despair or just afraid? You often get a, a tongue lashing for it, right? And so we lash out when we feel that way. Jacob also, this is inappropriate because he exaggerated his situation. That's a dangerous thing to do for a leader from a trusted 
uh, figure from a pastor, right? We need to be balanced. We need to live in an above reproach kind of way. And as a, as a man, as the leader of his house here, to not respond in this kind of exaggerated emotional way, throwing a, tantrum, uh, a temper tantrum, a pity party, right? But being a little more resolved, exemplifying a little more faith and trust in the Lord, given all that he's seen and all that God has done in his life. We never measure our response by what we see, but we measure it by what we know. And here's what we know. One of the things we know is 2 Corinthians 4.17 in the New Living. It's on the screen. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. And so... Paul says to the church, we don't look at the troubles we can see now. That's not what we look at, what I've been slapped in the face by. We don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen. God has something else coming. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. And that's the good that God is accomplishing through all of these things. Jacob responds in the way that he does. Everything's coming against me, this big explosion here. But that is a lie that is not the truth. And if you know the rest of the story, we'll see. God was bringing such blessing to Jacob and this family and creating this nation and providing for this people and all the rest. Uh, Jacob wouldn't have believed it if God had shared it at this time. It was so good. So God's working toward a blessing even through this moment of discomfort, right? And his opportunity is to trust and obey as opposed to kind of lead his family astray, right? Curse God and die kind of thing. I'm just going to go down to the grave. I guess guess that's it. I guess it's over kind of thing. We see the despair. We have compassion for that. And yet we also recognize it to be wrong. And we've got to strip ourselves from this kind of response to trouble, to trials, to tribulation. If we simply look at the problem that sits in front of our face and we forget the God that we know that we serve, well, this is what will happen. But when we see through the trouble, that present circumstance, to the faithful God who has never failed a single time, who's still on his throne, right, is still working, then faith begins to stir. Faith begins to blossom. And we can simply trust our way through that difficult circumstance, right? God hasn't abandoned you. God is still working. And this is the confidence that we need to be nurturing, right? All things are against me. It's just not true. It's not real. He's seeing just a little part Of this picture. And isn't it funny? We take this verse for granted, but we really shouldn't sometimes. All things are not against us. In fact, we have a God who's for us, right? Romans 8 28, we remember this word. God reminds us today that all things, all things are working together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Do you love God? Okay, hope you do. If so, this applies to you. Amen. I love that. Are you the called according to his purpose? Yes. And if you love God, you are the called according to his purpose. All things are working together for you. This is a verse you can grab and hold on to like an anchor for your psyche, for your soul, when we're all tempted to throw a temper tantrum and have a pity party and lead others astray by just this, these eruptions that come from despair. All things are working together. We grab onto those promises. We dig down deep into them and they hold us through these difficulties, these trials, these seasons of suffering. We also remember what Paul says in Romans 8 verse 35, new living. He says, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? And the answer is, He'll go on to say very clearly is no. This is a verse you can look to and grab onto and we wish, you know, uh, 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 Jacob would have or could have. In fact, it wasn't written. He can't, but you and I can, right? Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? The answer is what? No, and we'll go on to read it. 
But he gets specific. He gets real. And this comes from Paul, a guy who suffered greatly, tremendously. Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry, if we're destitute, naked, or in danger, or threatened with death? Life's going to involve these, these things, right? Famine, nakedness, peril, sword, right? You may have to defend your life or those of, uh, that you love. But these afflictions, these things, don't mean that God has forsaken us or abandoned us. Whatever's coming to my life, I can cling uh, uh, um, to this verse and trust that God is working. He is moving. Uh, he's doing something, and it's going to produce good in my life. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing. Do you love God? Are you the called according to his purpose? Then this applies to you. Nothing can separate us. This was Paul, Paul's conclusion here in Romans 8. Let's keep reading verse 37. Paul says, no, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ. It's not because of you. It's not based on you. Well, I'm a bad boy today. I haven't been that good. That's not the point. That's not brought into this verse, right? But this love is based on the character of God, the faithfulness of God. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And Paul said, I am convinced. Can you say those four words? And I am convinced. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, or demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in, uh, revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul says, I've, I've seen a lot, I've gone through a lot, and I've come to this conclusion. I am absolutely convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And this is the anchor among so many that can hold us during these times. Man, when bad news comes, something burns down or blows up or somebody goes into the grave, which some will today, right? This is the anchor that holds us sure and steadfast. And I ask you this question today, something I was thinking about this week. Do you as a Christian, do you have this kind of confidence in God's love? Can you say as Paul does here, I am convinced nothing is going to change my mind. I know more than I know anything else in this life or the next that God's love for me will never change. Never He'll always be faithful. He'll always be merciful. He'll always show up at the right time. Though I may see this or feel that, it doesn't change who he is and what he said. Are you convinced of God's love for you? If you are convinced, man, you have, you have joy. You're happy, right? That's often what joy looks like. If you're persuaded of God's love for you, it doesn't mean you're not tempted. Those who say they're never, never tempted about anything are just lying, right? We know that, right? We're tempted to, to doubt, but we choose to trust. And that choice, well, gets easier the more we do that, the more we strengthen that faith. The Lord's love for you never changes, never fades, never fails. And he ministers that love to us to remind us of that reality. Do you have this kind of confidence in God's love for you? Are you convinced of it in the way that Paul uh, says here and demonstrates for us? If you're not, that's okay. Would you just be honest with yourself and with the Lord about that today? Man, I'm not convinced that God loves me that much, right? If you're not convinced, then you don't know God that well. And that's the case. That's a problem that can be easily solved. Because all you need to do is just pray and just ask, Lord, something's missing here from what Paul is saying and demonstrating from my life. It's just not there as it could be. So what can I do? What would you do to teach me 
your love. As it was already said, Lord, I want to taste and see that you're good. I want to know that I know that I know. You can pray to the Lord and ask him to reveal his love to you and to keep on teaching you about his love and leading you in his love. That is the Christian life. I pray that we are being a witness to the world who does not yet know the Lord. And may this be the gospel that we teach and preach. Christianity is not just about being right. Well, it's right, you see. Join the church because we're right and everyone else is wrong. That's true, but not the best way to communicate that message. Right? We're righteous, we're holy, and everyone else is not. That's true, but it doesn't come from you. Right? We, we really got to be careful here. This is what Christianity is. Isn't this what has captured your heart and caused you to yield yourself to God? I'm a knucklehead, man. I'm still a knucklehead in every way that I always was. And yet, what causes my heart to break and soften and yield and obey? It's the love of God that constrains us, that compels us to do everything and anything that God could ask us to do. That's what this is. This relationship that we now have with Almighty God through Jesus Christ made possible by the Holy Spirit, that's what this is. And it's based on love. God's goodness and His grace manifested by His love. And that's exactly what He said it is and was. For God so loved the world that He gave. Right? not wishing that any would perish. If you feel that you're not understanding or are lacking, if you're not convinced of the love that God has for you, then just ask Him to reveal it to you, whether you're saved or not. But especially if you're a Christian here today, and man, you're just hard on yourself. There's a difference between being convicted of sin, right? And just being condemning on yourself. That's what the enemy does. That's what he wants you to hear. That is uh, what he wants you to be consumed with is just those voices of condemnation that paralyze you from experiencing the Lord, doing anything for God. If you're hard on yourself, man, if you doubt how much the Lord truly loves you, then just ask him to reveal that love to you. For Jesus said, Matthew 7, verse 8, it's in the NIV, for everyone who asks Read it with me. Receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks you for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a steak? If you then are evil and yet you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Ask the Lord to help you understand his love for you, to accept his love for you, to be changed by his, his love for you. This is what the Christian life is about. And when these times of trial come, and they will, we've already said that, right? This is what's going to hold you sure and steadfast, this anchor for our souls, which is the love of God. And so Jacob cries out here, and we'll get into the rest next week. He's just looking at the problem, right? Being overwhelmed in his response and reaction to it. God is not a part of this picture, and that's the problem. But as we'll see, the Lord's faithful, and he's going to finish the story. And Jacob's going to, again, continue this process of growing and maturing, and he's going to look back and see the faithfulness of God, which is a beautiful story. And that's going to be all of our stories, right? We look back over the years, and we see the faithfulness and the goodness and the mercy and the love of God for no good reason, right? The Lord's going to get you there. There's no question about that. Lord, help us to respond in faith when these times of trial come. So just two points and I'm done. Number one, I hope you write it down or remember it. Number one, fear will always lead to foolishness. Fear will always lead to foolishness. Being afraid, despairing. Uh, despair can turn into bitterness, right? Fear will always lead to foolishness. And secondly, Faith will always produce good fruit in your life. Faith will always produce good fruit in your life.
And it's that good fruit that we're looking for that God's seeking to produce in us and through us. Because I tell you, this life is not about us. It's not about you and it's not about me. It's about those that are around us, right? And so guaranteed good fruit by choosing to trust the Lord even when those times of trial come. Maybe it's going to come today. Maybe it's going to come tomorrow or next week, but believe you me, it's going to come. Bad news, dad, or whatever, right? How are we going to respond? Are we, are we going to remember who the Lord is and who we are to him, trust and obey, or, man, lead others astray? How are we going to respond? Why don't we pray? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We rejoice that someone like you would speak to people like us today. Thank you for this grace. Thank you for this mercy. Lord, continue to change us and make us more like Jesus. Do that as you say you will. God, through your overwhelming love. God, and for those who question it or doubt it or think they've gone too far to receive it, Lord, remind them, God, that they're wrong. Lord, that there's nothing that can separate us from your love. God, there's nothing that can interfere with the relationship you have with your kids. Thank you, Lord, that whatever comes into our life passes through nail-printed hands. Lord, we remember that you love us and we know you love us because you gave your life for us. And so whatever comes, Lord, through your sovereignty, Lord, through your parental oversight and ability, Lord, it's for our good. It's going to produce something wonderful eventually. God, you're ever after this goal of teaching us and maturing us and growing us. And sometimes we ask you to do it. And when you do, we give you a hard time like Jacob here. Oh, help us to trust, Lord. Help us, God, to... Lord, to grab that anchor, Lord, uh, often and every time we need to, when we feel thrown, when we feel, Lord, beaten by the winds and waves of life, to hold on to you and to trust, Lord, even if it's just that one thing, that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Thank you, Lord, that you will weather us, uh, help walk us through any storm, got any bit of bad news that comes our way. Ensure, Lord, that every, Lord, person um, who hears this message today, God, is challenged to consider the love you have for them and to receive it. We thank you, Lord. We love you. Bless your people, God, as we shut off our computers, Lord, and as we close our Bibles for now and go our way. Lord, remind us that we're, as it was said, ambassadors for Christ in these last days, that we are teachers and preachers, Lord. Um, God, that we are a city on a hill. God, that we're to be light and salt to those in our lives and help us to be that very thing. Provide for us, heal us, Lord. Protect us and bless us, God. In all things, govern over us, we pray. Lord, thank you for those who have served us today. God, who have allowed us to sit still and receive your word and worship you. Those, God, who are uh, in the parking lot, ensuring our safety. Lord, those who are caring for the kiddos, those who have cleaned and clean every week. God, those who give to keep the lights on. Lord, thank you for those who make all this ministry possible. We thank you, God. We rejoice together. In Jesus' name, let's say amen. Amen, amen. We love you. God bless you. If you would like some prayer, come forward. The prayer team's going to be down here up front. If you're watching and streaming from home, don't feel like you can't reach out. Send us a message. Email us. Call us. Text us. Band app, Facebook, and every other way that we have to contact you. Uh, make sure you reach out if you have a need or a prayer request. Remember, you can give online uh, and many other ways. The website will direct you to those means. If you're here be a blessing to somebody else before you go. If it's quick, don't just run out. Just do one little thing. It's one little thing. Be a blessing to someone else before you go. We love you. God bless you.